All right, welcome to our second CSI Summer Science on the Screen program. Remember, we'll be offering these virtual programs every Wednesday at 10 a.m. up until August 5th on this YouTube channel that you're watching right now. We also are going to be answering questions throughout this program, so there's a chat box that you can type in and we'll answer questions as they come up. Today we're going to talk about the amazing aquatic underwater world that surrounds us here on the Outer Banks. We're going to talk about plankton and estuaries. We'll teach you how to build a plankton net, identify microscopic organisms, and we'll even do a homemade plankton race. We're going to be doing that all in one hour? Yeah. Or less? We better get started. <laughs> So let's talk by starting a talk about estuaries. What are estuaries, Dave? So estuaries are semi-enclosed bodies of water that have freshwater inputs from rivers and saltwater inputs from the ocean. And why are they important? Well, so the estuaries that we're going to talk about today are found right here. Um, right behind the building is the Croatan estuary. But I also want to point out that we have where the freshwater rivers are coming from and the salt water is coming through our three inlets that we have, Ocracoke Inlet, Hatteras Inlet, and Oregon Inlet. Cool. And they're important because um, they're really important as a nursery area. So smaller fish will live and other aquatic life will live in the estuaries and grow larger and then move out into the ocean. And they're really important for flooding. Um, they help reduce the flooding that takes place and also work as a filter. So as Things come down those rivers that we don't necessarily want moving into other bodies of water. Um, the estuary hope, helps to hold on to some of the things and filter it out. You mentioned a nursery. What kind of animals live there? Um, we could have animals that are invertebrates, which means they don't have a background, backbone. Things like um, shrimp and crabs. We also have lots of different types of fish. Uh, speckled trout, red drum, flounder, things like that live in our estuary. And then even animals like um, terrestrial animals or animals that live on the land or birds also utilize the estuary and the different aquatic life that live in them. Cool. Um, so the estuary right behind us, like I said, it's part of a very important um, group of estuaries. Can you tell us more about that group of estuaries? Yeah, sure. So you mentioned the Croatan Sound. We are one of eight major sounds that are in the Albemarle Pamlico estuary system. It's the second largest in the U.S. and includes over 9,000 miles of shoreline. Um, on that shoreline, there's about 4. million acres of farmland in the region, so the estuary is important for filtering out all of the runoff that occurs from the agriculture. It is also about half of the juvenile fish habitat for the East Coast. And if we wanted to put a dollar sign on it, recreational fisheries brought in $1.6 billion for North Carolina in 2008. That's a lot of money. Mm -hmm. So our estuary is important. We talked about animals that live in it already. Um, and so I wanted to show you a food web. And so food web shows how the different animals may impact other animals within the system. And so today, um, we're going to talk about a few specific animals that are really important for the basis of the food web. Um, but all the animals within the food web interact with each other. And so you can see towards the right side of the food web that um, the larger animals are going to benefit from eating the smaller animals, and those smaller animals are also going to benefit from eating smaller animals. And so we move up the food web, um, and all the animals are interconnected. And so we have producers, things that make the energy, and then we have consumers, things that eat the producers and other consumers. Cool. And right out um, in our Albemarle and Pamlico estuarine system, we have lots of different habitats. And so we have oyster flats, or oyster reefs and mud flats, sandy beaches. Um, we have fringing marsh and submerged aquatic vegetation. But there's something that's common throughout all those different habitats. Do you have any idea what we'd find in all those different habitats? I have a feeling it might be some plankton. It is. It's plankton. Sweet. Do you know what plankton are? Or should I describe it? Go ahead. You go ahead. Sweet. Um, plankton are wanderers or drifters, so that means that they are unable to swim against the current or have limited ability to do so. Um, many cannot be seen by, with the naked eye, but um, despite what I thought I learned on SpongeBob, that plankton are small, even jellyfish like these up on the screen um, are plankton as well. So if we look at this, well, plankton are important for a number of reasons one of which is they produce a lot of the oxygen that we need to breathe. Um, so if we look at this picture of the globe or the earth, um, we'll see that the plankton are shown in green. 
And if you look very closely, you'll see that plankton are, are near the close coastlines. Most of the plankton are found right along the coast. Any idea why plankton will be found along the coast? Does it have something to do with habitat? It kind of does. So plankton require a limiting nutrient um, called iron. And so where there's iron present, there can be more plankton present. And iron comes from rocks. And so the wind will blow that iron off the coastline into the water, and then that iron will be available for plankton to use. There's two basic types of plankton. Um, there's phytoplankton, which are producers. So they take sunlight, CO2, and nutrients, and they turn that into usable energy. And so they're the basis of the food chain. So we said that plankton provide oxygen that we need, and they also are the basis of the aquatic food chain. So those are the two big things that plankton do that are really important. The other type of plankton um, that is a consumer is called a zooplankton, um, and so they're going to eat other zooplankton or phytoplankton. Within the phytoplankton, there are also two, ty two different types. You have your dinoflagellates, and they produce bioluminescent light, or living light, and that helps them with feeding, attracting mates, and also with protection. And then we also have diatoms, of which there are 100,000 species, and they use um, pigments related to brown algae and kelp to help them photosynthesize and produce their own food. Um, one of the things that's also really cool about them is that they can move around small molecules in their bodies to inflate themselves um, and control their buoyancy. So the zooplankton, one of the really interesting things about zooplankton are some zooplankton look the same their whole life and they never grow into anything else. And other zooplankton are only planktonic for a period of their life cycle and then they'll actually grow into a, a different looking organism. So it's just part of their life cycle that they're the plankton. Um, but the zooplankton, they actually um, are part of the largest migration on the planet where they move down in the water column during the day to avoid predation or avoid things that want to eat them. And then they'll move up in the water column at night to eat the phytoplankton um, because the phytoplankton need to stay near the surface to get sunlight to be able to create that energy. So the zooplankton are moving up and down in the water column and by mass that is the largest migration on the entire planet. Sweet. Um, to be able to study these plankton, we first have to catch them um, and be able to see them. So the way that we do that is by using plankton nets, which are um, made of a fine mesh net with a collection jar at the bottom. And once you get them in the jar, you can take them back to the lab. So right now, I'll show you guys how to make your own plankton net. So we're going to need a few different things. First, we need a key ring, a small jar, some pantyhose or a stocking, four pieces of string, and a coat hanger or a piece of wire. So the first thing that you're going to do is take your wire and wrap it to each other to be able to create a circle, right like that. Then you're going to take the top of your stocking and open it up and feed it through your wire circle. Once you've got it there, you're going to wrap it around the wire like that. So that'll be the top of your net. Then you're going to take the foot end and you're going to cut the toes off of your stocking. And once that's done, You'll open that as well, and then take your jar and place it inside what used to be the toe. So it'll cover it like that. You're going to take one of your pieces of string. I've taped the ends so they don't fray. And you're going to wrap it around to secure the stocking to the jar. Sometimes it's a little tricky. If you have an extra hand, it might be helpful. Once you have it wrapped, you can tie it in a knot so that it stays nice and secure. Like that, and that's your bottom end. Then we're gonna go back up to the top, and you'll need your scissors again, because we're going to take one edge, be careful doing this, and you're going to poke 
three equally distant holes into your stocking. Then you're going to take your first piece of string and put it through one of the holes and tie it tight around the wire and the stocking. Once you're done with that first piece, it'll look like this. Now you're going to do that with your other two holes and pieces of string. So Parker, if you didn't have a piece of wire, you could use um, a coat hanger or mm -hmm. something like that to make it, or you can even cut out part of a soda bottle, a plastic soda bottle. Anything that will hold open that, that mouth of the net is really what we need. So if you don't have just a piece of wire at home, you might have to get creative, but we just need something that will hold open the stocking so that the water will go through it. That's right. And then our next piece, we have a key ring, but if you don't have an extra key ring, you could use um, a paper clip or something like that that you could just get all those strings to attach to a single point. Right, and the way that we're going to attach them, you want to have them as close to equal as possible when you gather them here. And then we're going to feed that key ring or paper clip, whatever it is that you have, through that string and tie a knot there. This key ring is going to allow you to have a better grip on it and hold it as you drag it through the water. And there you go, there's your plankton net. You have your key ring to hold on to, your open end, you'll drag it through the water with the pantyhose and you'll get what you need in your jar. And so plankton are found not just in the ocean or in the estuary, but also in freshwater environments. And so if you're watching us from away from the coast, you can still build a plankton net and go run it through water and see what you come up with. Right, so I'm going to head down right now and I'll show you guys how to use your plankton net. Great, so while Parker's making her way down to the dock, uh, we're going to go through just a couple more things and then we'll see her at the dock. Um, so one other thing we want to be aware of with plankton is there are some types of plankton that are toxic and there's groups that keep an eye out for those toxic plankton and see when they grow and where they bloom and we try to avoid them when we can, um, but there are types of plankton that can be harmful, harmful for shellfish or for, um, you know, if people eat the shellfish, they can actually get sick as well. And then in the long term, thinking about how things change, right, as our oceans change, as temperatures rise, um, as we might see salinity change and other parameters change, um, we'll also see a change in our plankton. And so our plankton is the basics of the food chain, right, that's what other things are going to rely on for food and energy. And so if we have a change in salinity or a change in temperature, we might see our plankton species may change a little bit, which may also change what's happening in the food web. So at this point, we're going to check in with Parker down at the dock, and she's going to show us what we can do um, to catch some plankton. Here we are on this beautiful day out on the Croatan Sound. We are going to use this net to catch microscopic organisms. We will just drag it back and forth across the surface. Why would many phytoplankton be near the surface, you ask? That's because they need sunlight for photosynthesis. As we drag the net back and forth, the phytoplankton will get caught in the fine mesh of the net and eventually collect in this bottle. Then we'll be able to take it back to the lab to discover. Here we are on this beautiful day. 
So here we are back in the lab. Thanks, Parker. Um, we have a plankton sample that we've collected. And so um, the next step is going to be to see what is in that plankton sample. And so I'm going to show you two different types of microscopes. Oops. Um, and these two different types of microscopes can be used for different magnifications. That's the main difference between them. Um, and so this is called a compound microscope. It can go up to 100 times magnification, so 100 times what you can see um, just by looking at it. So it can get very, very close and give you a lot of detail. And to use a compound microscope, what we need to do um, is take a drop of water. We're going to put it onto a slide. The slide is just a small piece of glass. And we're going to take this thing called a cover slip and put that on top of the drop of water. And what that does is it kind of holds the plankton in place and it keeps your microscope from getting very wet. Now that we have our slide um, into our tray here, the next thing we're going to do is look through the ocular or through the eyepieces. Um, so we're going to, today we're going to start on just four times magnification. We're going to use this knob here to focus. So this is the focus knob. And this microscope also has a light. So we'll turn the light on. We're going to bring the tray all the way to the bottom, look through the eyepieces, and then slowly bring up the focus knob until things inside look in focus. And that's the way we would use a compound microscope. We also have this scope called a stereoscope, um, which only does two or four times magnification. So remember that one was 100. This one's only two or four. We're going to put a couple drops of water into a tray. And then we're going to the same thing. We'll turn the light on, look through the ocular pieces, and then use the focus knob to go ahead and see um, what type of plankton is present. And so we actually have a short video of what it looks like in the microscopes um, that we're going to show you so you can see some of the plankton that we've caught right off our dock. These are pretty neat. Oh, so these, these are plankton that you're seeing are called barnacle nauplii. Um, and the nauplii, the barnacles, are, are things that attach. You've probably seen them. They attach to um, piers and to pilings. And so they have a part of their life cycle where they look a little bit different and they're free swimming. That was a barnacle nauplii that just went through the screen. And then they have a part where they're attached to those pilings. We also have different phytoplankton in this sample. We talked about dinoflagellates earlier. So a couple more facts about them. They are characterized by armored plates of cross-linked cellulose. They have two flagella and horns, which you can see really well on this one. Those U-shaped, um, those are the horns. Um, we also have the, this one right here. You can see that there are three horns on this one. Um, usually the flagella are a little bit harder to see, even with the microscope. But depending on the size of the dinoflagellate, you may be able to see those horns. But they also vary in size as well. We also have some diatoms. The Coscinodiscus is a genus name, and there are so many different species. They're all diatoms, they're unicellular, and their bodies are made of silica, which helps them keep their structure. Great. How many of you knew there was so much living in a drop of water that we can't normally see? Definitely wasn't me. I was thinking about that, and I bet we have so much that ends up in our ears and our nose and our mouth when we swim. Yikes. Definitely. Parker, can you think of an animal that eats almost entirely plankton? I can think of a bunch, but the largest is probably a blue whale. That's right. I have to start asking you harder questions. <laughs> so we're going to uh, take a, a quick second and watch a video of how CSI studies aquatic life, um, and they actually look at plankton to learn more about a specific environment. So this short video will show you a little bit of research that's taking place off our coast. My name is Lindsay Doves. I am the Associate Director of the North Carolina Renewable Ocean Energy Program, for which I also do environmental assessment research. The focus of my research is assessing the environmental impacts of Gulf Stream-based energy. However, we don't know very much about the ecology of this area, so we don't know much about what the environmental impacts will be because we don't know which organisms are using what parts of the Gulf Stream, when, and for what reasons. So a lot of our research to date has focused on kind of characterizing that environment. We have done work on sea turtles, marine mammals, and also sargassum. Sargassum is a pelagic macroalgae, so it is not phytoplankton, it is a larger type of primary producer. And 
It is found in most of the world's oceans. This pelagic macroalgae floats at the surface of the Gulf Stream and it kind of gets entrained along the western wall and accumulates there where it's really important habitat for marine organisms and it's actually protected habitat because of how it supports fish. And we are finding that sargassum is also very important for nutrient cycling and just primary production within the Gulf Stream serving as the base of that food web. Sargassum is important because it's an extremely unique marine structure. Because it spends its entire life floating out in the open ocean, it provides structure in an environment that's otherwise devoid of that kind of complexity. Structure provides habitat for anything from planktonic organisms all the way up to your charismatic megafauna, like whales and cetaceans, migratory fish. My research deals with the very fundamentals of the Gulf Stream environment because we're looking at the nutrient cycling capabilities and specifically nitrogen, which is the limiting nutrient in that environment. Any process that delivers biologically available nitrogen to that environment is theoretically going to increase primary productivity, which will cascade up the food chain. My research fits into the North Carolina Renewable Ocean Energy Program because our mission is to find marine hydrokinetic energy off the coast of North Carolina that can help meet the energy demands of our state in a sustainable manner. And so that means that if we are to harvest energy from um, marine hydrokinetic or wave or current resources off of the North Carolina coast, we have to do so with the other uses of that environment in mind, including uses by other animals and organisms, as well as humans. All right, the last thing we're gonna do today is we're going to build our own plankton and we encourage you to try this at home as well. And we're going to try to build a plankton that can sink very slowly through the water column. Um, so it's a race, but it's a race to be the slowest. Um, and so this relates to how plankton move up and down in the water column during that deal vertical migration that we talked about earlier. Um, and so we're building a zooplankton, and we want it to sink really slowly. So this would be during the daytime when there's things looking to eat it. Um, and so Parker and I have some really basic stuff that I'm sure many of you have at home. We have some yarn. Um, we have a paper clip, we have a piece of foil, a couple small fishing weights. Let's see what else we have. A toothpick, a little bit of clay, a safety pin. Some it tin doesn't, foil. But some tin foil. It doesn't really matter exactly what you have. You just want to have a few things and you're going to try to build something that sinks the slowest. Um, and so we're going to spend a few minutes trying to build our own and then we'll do a couple races and see between the two of us who can build the slowest. But we also encourage you um, to find some things and try to build something that sinks very, very slowly. All right, we'll get started. Three minutes on the clock. All right. So this is one of those activities that until our three minutes is up, we can test it as many times as we need to. So we're designing something, we're gonna test our prototype, and then we're gonna redesign based on what we learned. First thing I'm gonna test is a golf tee with some noodle and clay and it has a little piece of weight in it to see if it'll sink at all. Not quite. What have you gotten yours so far? Ooh. Ooh. So I just have a piece of clay and a paper clip and a little piece of pool noodle for the flotation. And so if yours doesn't sink at all, then you can't win. So it has to sink, but you want it to sink slowly. Ah. I'm striking out over here.
Yours are looking good, <laughs> Dave. All right, let's do two more tests and then we'll be on to our full race. Ooh, oh, comes back up. I'm getting close. <laughs> Can't get this through. Maybe the golf tee was a bad idea. Last one, are you ready? <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we'll give you another minute. Where's my other piece of noodle? So while we're waiting for Parker to figure <laughs> hers out, don't forget, next week we're going to focus on fish biology. Um, so we're going to talk about different parts of a fish, adaptations, why they live in different environments. Um, and that'll be next Wednesday at 10 a.m. Are you ready now? I think so. All right, so we'll the see. best of three series. All right. One, Go ahead. Two, one, two, three. Oh. I feel like height is killing me on this. Maybe. All right. One, two, three. All right. Definitely the winner. <laughs> Thank you guys all for tuning in, and hopefully we'll see you next week. Have a good week. See y'all.